Hello, and welcome. My name is Philip, and today I would like to tell you a story about a man. A man who made a dark pact, an evil arrangement, a deal with the devil. In Germany, during the early 16th century, stories began to circulate about a scholar and alchemist named Johann Faust. These stories told of how the reclusive Faust had gained his great wealth and knowledge by communing with devils and making a deal with them, securing their service in return for his immortal soul. The tale of the damned doctor captured the imaginations of Renaissance Europe, and has since been immortalised in German poetry by Goethe, and English drama by Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus. Although there are different versions of the story, the key points remain the same. Faust, or Faustus, is a scholar with a thirst for knowledge and a serious ego. He wants to be the best, and the way he conceives of doing that is by summoning demons to aid him. He makes a deal, often signs a contract in blood, and is sworn the service of spirits and demons with which he seeks to achieve his aims. Things get out of hand, and Faust often loses more than he gains before finally either recanting and being saved, or more often, being condemned to hell. Faust's impact on literature and culture shouldn't be understated. We even use the phrase Faustian pact to describe an ill-fated deal. The Faust legend is definitely one worthy of study. <laughs> it is not, however, the legend I want to tell you about today. I want to tell you a different story, one which likely served as inspiration for the Faust legend. It's a story of a man named Theophilus. Theophilus was the Archdeacon of Adana in modern-day Turkey. Well known for being both exceptionally pious and incredibly humble, when the old bishop died there was little doubt as to who should succeed him. The church elders gathered and unanimously elected Theophilus as the new bishop of Adana. When they approached their favoured choice, however, Theophilus turned them down. In a show of great humility, Theophilus claimed he was unworthy of their praise and of the high office, and told them to seek someone more deserving. Crestfallen, the elders did not know what to do, and so, after much debate, elected a different archdeacon instead. This new bishop had always secretly resented Theophilus, and loathed the fact that he had been second choice. He resolved to use his new power to ruin Theophilus. He started cruel rumours about the Archdeacon, claiming he was prideful, or invented stories about his family, anything he could concoct to heap shame upon Theophilus. As these malicious rumours spread, the bishop then used them as an excuse to strip Theophilus of his position of Archdeacon. Theophilus bitterly regretted his decision, and as anger began to fester in his heart, he decided to seek aid from outside the church. The ex-Archdeacon sought out a necromancer, who lived outside of the city and with his guidance began to commune with evil spirits. Theophilus, thinking only of revenge, summoned Satan himself, 
and made a deal with him. The devil would give Theophilus all he thought he was due, but in return demanded that he renounce Christ and the Virgin Mary. To seal the pact, the devil conjured a contract that Theophilus signed with his own still warm blood. Theophilus was given what the devil promised, but immediately he was overcome with grief and shame. Filled with regret, he prayed to the Virgin Mary for forgiveness and salvation. After forty days of fasting and repentance, the Holy Virgin appeared to Theophilus. She chastised him for his foolishness and sin, but, seeing that he was truly penitent, agreed to intercede with God on his behalf. What followed was a further thirty days of fasting and prayer, after which the Holy Virgin appeared again. This time she granted Theophilus absolution, but Satan was incensed. He did not wish to surrender the soul he had claimed so readily. What's more, he had a legal contract, signed in Theophilus's own blood. Three days after the Virgin Mary's appearance, the devil had Theophilus awake to find the infernal contract upon his chest. This reminder of his damnation did not have the intended effect, however, for instead of causing Theophilus to despair, it only steeled his resolve. He snatched up the contract and took it to the rightful bishop, the man who had been the cause of all Theophilus's woe. On his knees, Theophilus confessed to all that he had done and showed him the contract. The bishop took it from him and cast it into the fireplace, burning the document to ashes. Theophilus felt the burden lift from his soul and in sheer rapture and relief died that very instant and his soul flew straight to heaven where it would dwell in everlasting peace. And there you have it. The story was first recorded in the 6th century by someone named Eutychianus of Adana who claimed to have been an eyewitness to all the events he described. Well that's true or not is another matter entirely, but we do know that Theophilus was a real historical person and was actually venerated as Saint Theophilus the Penitent. We also know that this story is very important for two big historical reasons. The first is that it is the first recorded story of a person selling their soul to Satan. It introduces elements which endure to this day. The idea of the devil relying on legally binding contracts, and of them being signed in a person's own blood, recurs again and again in medieval legends, in Faust, in modern games and horror films. Have you ever wondered why the devils in D&D are lawful evil? Here's why. Rather interestingly, because this legend is so old, it actually predates the church's condemnation of witchcraft and speaking to spirits. Theophilus's sin is selling his soul, not necromancy. The second historically significant thing about this legend is that it played a major role in establishing the concept of the intercession of the Virgin Mary. German canoness poet, historian, and all-round badass Hrotzvitha recounted the legend of Theophilus in the 10th century, and the theological significance of the Virgin Mary really starts to increase during the 10th and 11th centuries. It's no surprise then that the legend is told and retold as a way to emphasise her importance. In some versions, after granting absolution, Mary goes to Satan to recover the contract herself, often giving the devil a telling off in the process. Sometimes she straight up whips the devil until he surrenders the contract. 
So where does this leave us? Well, I for one think it's really interesting to see the impact that legends and stories can have throughout history, and how something from so long ago can still be part of our popular culture today. It is also fun to think that if you were to speak to someone from Norman England, maybe about Faust, they wouldn't have any idea who you were talking about. But they would know just how dangerous it could be to create a Theophilusian pact. Farewell. <laughs> I want to tell you about a different story. Zooms. Um. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>